Starting Overdrive. Real stories of starting over with Red Seton. Hey everyone, welcome to Starting Overdrive, where you'll hear real stories of starting over from real people of all walks of life. I'm your host, Reg Seaton. Welcome to part eight of the Starting Overdrive Turning Point series called The Biggest Opportunity of My Life. In this new segment of the podcast called Turning Points, I focus on significant life-changing events directly connected to the process of starting over. Events or turning points that alter who we are force us to change direction in life, and let go of everything we once knew. This segment is an exploration into life-defining, irreversible turning points that rock us to the very core of our being and force us to accept change whether we like it or not. It's through these irreversible turning points that we truly learn who we are on the deepest level, what we can handle in life, the true power of the human spirit, and who we were meant to become. On many levels, Who we thought we were before these major life-changing events was only preparing us for who we're supposed to be after the turning point. The following story is an extension of the most important, irreversible turning point that changed my life forever. This episode is a continuation from Part 7, called Finding Your True Purpose, in which I told the story of discovering my true purpose in life, my career direction, after moving across the country by train in order to start over in Vancouver, British Columbia. In the previous episode, I discussed how the discovery of that purpose was the very beginning of a 20-year career in which I became an early pioneer in one of the most popular online industries, and also a pioneer in remote working over 20 years ago. As I've said in previous episodes, my professional world opened up in ways I could have never imagined, taking me to Los Angeles, New York City, San Francisco, Hawaii, Hollywood, and beyond, to world premiere red carpets, and working with some of the biggest companies and names in the world. It was this true purpose in life that became the gateway to making my dreams come true. Again, like I've said before, it sounds so cliche to say that, I mean, messages about making your dreams come true are everywhere today. From social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, Discord, to the many podcasting platforms, to online course platforms, learning and educational networks, collaboration networks, webinars, and more. There's no shortage of inspiration and personal development and resources online when it comes to making your dreams come true. The internet has made it easy to think differently about your career and think unconventionally about life. In many ways, the internet has made it easy for anyone to disrupt their own conventional life path, start over, and create their own online career. It really is fantastic. In the early to mid-90s, however, when I first arrived on the West Coast after moving from the East Coast to start a new life, there was very little support for thinking differently, unconventionally, and making your dreams come true. The internet didn't exist, so you were mostly relegated to bookstores and the local library when searching for personal development, self-help, and personal empowerment resources. In fact, at the time, most people, certainly the mainstream population, scoffed at personal development, inspiration, and motivation. Unlike today, if you wanted to change your life back then, there wasn't much support or resources that were widely or readily available you had to put in the real work and effort to find books and groups. Back then, transforming your life wasn't safe, acceptable, or easy. In the mid-90s, when the internet was just in its infancy, most people were afraid of the new technology. Most kept the internet at arm's length simply because they didn't understand it, nor could they see the transformative power it would have on every aspect of our lives. Back then, when technology was forcing us all to start over, with computers becoming mainstream, the internet activated people's fear of the unknown, their fear of change, and also their fear of risk. When the internet was just beginning, most people were slow to embrace the technology. In fact, when I first began working online, it took a decade before the mainstream population would embrace the internet. When I first began working remotely, also creating one of the first remote working content teams on the internet, It would take over two full decades, 21 years, for remote working to become mainstream. And that was just last year. When you listen to this podcast, 
and you hear me talking about changing my life and making my dreams come true, it's important for me to put this into proper context and perspective. I've said this numerous times. I'm not doing this to hear my own voice. My story actually means something to me on deep levels of experience and adversity. I was hit by a car at a young age when my life was just beginning. I was in a coma for a week, underwent numerous life-saving surgeries, including three major brain surgeries, five years of recovery, in and out of the hospital, all at the exact same time as my parents were going through a nasty, bitter divorce. I was forced to start over on levels people can't even begin to imagine. I know what it's like to lose my family. I know what it's like to lose myself. I know what it's like to lose my identity. I know what it's like to nearly lose my life, not once, but several times. I know what it's like to have no choice or say in the matter when change is forced upon you. I also know what it's like to have my life put on hold and reach a dead-end crossroads where the future felt hopeless. There was a time in my life when I truly thought everything to come in this episode was impossible, and yes, only a dream. It's important for me to say that because I've actually lived every aspect of this story. This isn't cliche for me. All of this story is very real. The year I got the biggest opportunity of my life, however, was 1996. It came at a time following a deep commitment, a promise to myself, that I'd do whatever it took to change my life, find my true purpose, and create the direction for myself in the future I'd always envisioned and knew I was capable of creating after my accident. After a lengthy period of discovery, I committed to becoming a writer. As I mentioned in the previous episode, writing was my true career path, aligned with who I am and who I've always been. It's a talent and skill that came naturally to me, and still comes natural to me as I tell this story. After once feeling hopeless about my future on the east coast of Canada, moving across the country to the west coast, becoming lost all over again in search of direction and purpose, I committed to becoming a writer as a career. I was committed to doing whatever it took to become successful, learn, and grow as a writer. Nothing would stop me on my mission to becoming a writer. There was a lot I had to change about myself, and there was a lot I had to learn about being a writer. After clawing my way to university following my accident, studying both psychology and sociology, I was starting from scratch as a writer. Again, as I mentioned in the previous episode, I was working at a coffee shop in downtown Vancouver, Starbucks, before the company was a household name, taking extra shifts at a variety of stores to make ends meet. At one store in particular, I met another up-and-coming writer who was also writing online and, coincidentally, was from Nova Scotia, where I grew up. We clicked immediately with common interests, creative goals, and familiar, relatable struggles, both being from the East Coast. When I began my writing career, I didn't have a computer at the time. They were still insanely expensive and less accessible, so I was forced to buy an electric typewriter. Not long afterward, however, I started to work with and learn computers at home in 1994, beginning with a PC-386 before making the leap to a 486. The internet was just in its infancy, and I was able to make the slow shift away from the typewriter to writing on the computer with programs like Microsoft Word and other word processors. Not only was I writing on a home computer, I was also self-teaching myself everything there was to learn about computers, including DOS and how computers actually worked. I then began to explore the world of writing online in the very early days of the internet. To my surprise, there were entire websites, forums, publications, periodicals, and interactive writing communities online where I could learn, grow, and take my writing to new levels. Also to my surprise, especially since the internet was so new, barely in its infancy, there were writing-related websites and periodicals that actually paid money upon publication. At the time, as a writer, I was manually submitting articles to magazines and newspapers by snail mail through the regular mail at the post office then waiting weeks to hear back from the editors. The more articles you had out there to editors at various publications, the better your chances. But it was a long, arduous process. Suddenly, with the emergence of the Internet, writing-related websites were accepting articles by digital submission and paying writers for their work in a fraction of the time it took to wait for traditional print publications. I could submit numerous articles online and hear back from editors the very next day. I was just beginning my career as a writer at the exact same time the internet was changing the writing world. 
Rather than focus on being a writer via the traditional print medium, it didn't take long before a writing periodical about the changes within society wanted to publish one of my articles. The pay wasn't great at all. I think it was about $20 or $30 at the time. But it was my very first article published online. I still have the article printed off somewhere. After being published online, I went on to have several other articles published within a few months while still working at the coffee shop. The year was 1995, when I first started working at the coffee shop that would change my life. 1995 was also the same year the criminal trial of O.J. Simpson began, starting in January. The Houston Rockets beat the Orlando Magic to win the NBA championship. Pete Sampras and Steffi Graf both won individual men's and women's titles at Wimbledon that year. Steve Fawcett piloted the first solo transatlantic balloon flight in 1995. Cheryl Crow's All I Want to Do won Record of the Year, while Braveheart topped the movie box office and the music world lost Grateful Dead singer Jerry Garcia in 1995. Like I mentioned earlier, at the coffee shop, I met and started to work with another up-and-coming writer who was also writing online from Nova Scotia, where I grew up. Upon hitting it off, sharing our experiences, trying to make it in the new and budding online writing world, he asked me to join him in writing for the entertainment website he had been working with for the past year. The website was becoming more popular, he could use the help, and it would give me invaluable experience as a writer. The thought of writing online at the time was exciting. The internet was just beginning. I didn't think much of writing for the website other than it would be a great training ground to hone my skills and learn a new industry. His part of the website, called Test Pattern, was devoted to the latest news and stories in television and the new emerging home entertainment technology of DVD. The website combined TV and DVD content together. It was truly unique and innovative at the time. Test Pattern was a subsection of a larger entertainment movie and news website called Coming Attractions, which provided a database of the latest news, rumors, and speculation on all movie projects in Hollywood at various stages of development. I was eager to join a small team of writers who were all writing online. Over the next few months, I auditioned and practiced, so to speak, before officially joining the team in 1996. Like I said, I really didn't think much of the opportunity other than gaining more experience as a writer on a casual, hobby-type level. Little did I know, however, exactly the size and scope of opportunity I had been given. And this is a lesson for anyone listening in how sometimes you just need to remain open to opportunity, even if you don't see it. The more I contributed to test pattern and coming attractions in those very early days, the more I realized the weight of opportunity in front of me. I was absolutely floored, shocked, to learn that coming attractions was one of the most popular entertainment websites on the entire internet. It was the number one independent source of movie news and rumors behind Hollywood Reporter and Variety. Coming attractions, including test pattern, was the number one resource used by Hollywood filmmakers, executives, producers, actors, writers, and the mainstream media for the status and rumors on all top film and television productions. At the time, there were only about 10 to 20 significant entertainment websites on the entire internet. 10 to 20, that's it. They were mostly, if not all, independently owned and operated by writers and fans of the industry. Of those 20 outlets, 10 were considered to be major news resources. Out of those 10 outlets, 5 were considered to be the very top outlets in the entire online landscape. Coming Attractions was largely considered to be number one, also the most credible and ethical in its reporting. Keep in mind, like I mentioned before, most people feared the internet at the time. The internet was still largely unknown, and most people didn't take the internet seriously. That also included major entertainment corporations and companies that actually fought the advances of the internet. To give you perspective, when I first started writing for coming attractions and test pattern, Entertainment Tonight didn't even have a website other than to promote the television show. TV Guide didn't have a website other than an outlet to sell the magazine. None of the major entertainment companies had any online outlets or websites in 1996. Essentially, when it came to the internet, the major mainstream entertainment companies were asleep at the wheel. They didn't take the internet seriously. Interestingly, it was a fear of change from the status quo, mainstream entertainment companies, and the public at large 
Also a fear of the unknown that allowed independent writers like myself to completely disrupt the traditional print publication industry that existed and dominated the entertainment landscape for the previous century. In the future of the podcast, I'll talk more about this in relation to starting over, timing, innovation, and opportunity, but I do want to point out how embracing the unknown can be a huge advantage when everyone else is afraid of the unknown. Rather than one of many who is afraid and needs a guarantee to move forward, you become one of the few who isn't afraid to take steps forward despite not having all the immediate answers. While print magazines, newspapers, and entertainment television shows were bound by and shackled to monthly, bi-weekly, and daily deadlines when it came to breaking news, us new, independent journalists could break news and stories on the internet instantly and much more frequently. Readers could see entertainment news on the internet in near real time, when the news was actually breaking. For the major entertainment corporations, TV shows, newspapers, and print magazines, they were bound by traditional deadlines and can only break news, at best, 24 hours before, daily, weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly. As internet writers, we were flexible, speedy, innovative, and highly adaptable. We could break many stories in a period of 24 hours. We could pivot on a dime when news needed to be broken, whereas major mainstream resources, such as Entertainment Tonight, could only report the news the next day and TV Guide on a weekly basis. They were no longer the go-to resources because they couldn't keep up. As you may be able to tell by now, this was the biggest opportunity of my life. Not long after joining the team at Coming Attractions, I took on the title of co-director of content at Test Pattern and co-managing editor of Test Pattern with my colleague from the coffee shop. That same year, we also formed our first online content production company as writing partners. It was truly an exciting time. Suddenly, I was thrust into being at the very top of the entertainment industry as a writer and editor at the exact same time the internet was disrupting the power structure of that industry. In an instant, we had clout, power, and leverage in the entertainment industry as the number one independent online resource at the time. Again, to put this into perspective, especially in relation to my personal story told in this podcast, four years earlier, my life had reached a dead end on the East Coast after getting hit by a car, waking up from a coma, nearly losing my life, and feeling hopeless about my future. Suddenly, I was one of the top writers and editors in the entertainment industry, with the keys to the kingdom. Seemingly overnight, in an instant, I'm negotiating relationships and opportunities with networks like NBC, ABC, CBS, and movie studios such as Paramount, Warner Brothers, Universal Pictures, and more. Keep in mind, I'm doing all this at home, in a home office, on a computer, taking meetings via phone, also working remotely with my writing colleagues, and this was back in 1996. It seems odd to say now, but I've been in online business, an online entrepreneur, working from a home office, a home business, and working remotely for 25 years. In fact, our team of writers at Test Pattern would later go on to be one of the very first remote working content teams on the internet. This was the biggest opportunity of my life. I really couldn't believe it. In so many ways, the opportunity exceeded my experience as a writer. I was nervous about so many facets of what I was doing at the time. There were so many times I wondered whether I could do it, build a career, and live up to the opportunity, even though I didn't have the experience. Although I didn't understand where all this opportunity would lead, the one thing I knew was that it would lead to something good. I knew that the future I wanted, the future that I envisioned for myself, the future I once thought was impossible when I was in the hospital facing death after my accident, was in the unknown. That future was on the other side of fear. I was standing at the very edge of who I was, who I am, and who I wanted to be, the person I knew I could become in the future. This is where my experience of being in a coma played a huge role in how I dealt with the unknown. The fact is, I had already been to the unknown on a level of mortality, in a coma, in the hospital, facing brain surgery, all of my surgeries, whether I'd survive. The fact is, I did survive. There was nothing to fear. I had to pass through the unknown so many times to even have a life. This writing gig, 
years before the term gig economy even existed, was too big of an opportunity not to pursue. There were many times I was scared and filled with self-doubt. I mean, just imagine how it felt. One minute, you're lost in search of a purpose. You discover that purpose when you commit to being a writer. Then only months later, you're one of the top managing editors, content directors, and writers in the entire entertainment industry, with clout, leverage, and power to negotiate what you want in that industry. It was mind-boggling, to say the least. A pivotal moment came one afternoon in the first year when I had to make a call to an executive at ABC Television to form and negotiate a relationship with the company. I was young and inexperienced. I hadn't gone to school for this. My education was sociology and psychology. Only four years earlier, I was pumping gas, working for my father on the East Coast, feeling helpless. How in the world would I be able to negotiate what we need from a company like ABC Television? What business did I have doing any of this? So many insecure questions ran through my mind. What if I fail? In many ways, I felt like an imposter, which, again, I'll talk about in a future episode about overcoming imposter syndrome. It was very real. The day came when I had to make the call to ABC. I was so nervous. This one executive had a reputation of being aggressive, abrasive, and a straight shooter in negotiations. She had no time for weakness, insecurity, or small talk. She had a reputation for chewing up editors and spitting them out. I knew this going into the call, which made it even worse. I agonized all day whether to cancel the meeting. What the hell was I doing, and who in the world did I think I was? You're just a guy from Nova Scotia who got hit by a car. You're not supposed to be doing this. I mean, the fear was very real that day. I was at a crossroads within myself and with my life. About an hour before I had to make the call, I had an internal dialogue that I still remember to this day. I said to myself, if you can't make this call to the ABC executive, stand firm, have confidence, and negotiate what you need, then you can't pursue this opportunity any longer. You can't continue in this industry because you have to be honest with yourself. Being in this industry, you'll need to make many of these calls in the future. You can't get in over your head like that. If you can't make this call, you can't be a writer in this capacity. You have to quit. It was another moment in my life in which I made a deep commitment to myself. I knew that I couldn't quit. I had come too far in starting over and discovering my new direction in life. I had already been to the unknown on so many levels with my accident, being in a coma, brain surgery, nearly losing my life. I had already moved into the unknown, having moved across the entire country to a city I'd never been to before. The reality was, making this call to ABC was a piece of cake compared to what I'd been through. I just had to be honest with myself, be confident, and be myself. I made the call that day. The conversation went well, and I negotiated exactly what we needed out of the company. That one call began a great media relationship with ABC, and later Disney that lasted my entire career and created even more opportunities. There really wasn't anything to fear. There was just the call. It was a major life moment of conquering fear and gaining more self-confidence. I had worked through my fear to make the unknown known. In fact, a few years later, it was Disney that gave me the biggest interview opportunity of my life, which, as I keep mentioning, I'll talk about in a future episode. Interestingly, that interview opportunity was centered around starting over. If I hadn't made that call to ABC, had I given in to fear and my insecurities, another massive opportunity years later as an interviewer wouldn't have happened. Test Pattern was getting bigger and more popular as a television news resource. We were starting to become known for the latest breaking news and stories related to television and -and up-and-coming projects. In fact, to give you the scope of how big this opportunity really was at the time, back in the late 90s, I once wrote and broke exclusive news about a remake of the classic 1965 science fiction series Lost in Space, which had been in development as a television project in Hollywood for years. We had gotten a tidbit from an industry insider. It was a legitimate source, and so we broke the news. The next day, several top mainstream outlets and print publications picked up the story, including the New York Times. 
That's how big of an opportunity it really was to write for this website. At the time, the early days of the internet, there really wasn't a full-blown, standalone, television-related entertainment website. There really wasn't much television-related content online back then. So we put a call out on the website for remote writers in order to assemble a remote working team and create a standalone website devoted to TV and DVD. At the time, keep in mind, remember, it was only a subsection of coming attractions. We wanted to make Test Pattern its own website. While co-creating and building Test Pattern into its own website, we were asked to appear on ABC News in New York City, but had to turn the opportunity down because the technology to appear remotely didn't exist. It certainly wasn't accessible at the time. The only way we could appear was to actually fly to New York City. That's how early we were in the online entertainment industry. In the second year during my time with Test Pattern, a writer for the Associated Press wanted to join our team. He saw the emergence of the internet as the next generation of news, and he wanted to be part of the new movement. In forming a relationship with us, he wanted to train us in real, credible, associated press journalism and news reporting in exchange for us training him in the latest emerging technology and modern, more flexible journalism. Again, to put this into perspective for you, I went from feeling hopeless about my future on the East Coast four years earlier, with my life at a dead end, to four years later, being a managing editor at the very top of the entertainment industry, training an associated press journalist on my team. To put this even more into perspective, I know I keep saying that, but a lot happened back then that really I never talk about, and no one really knows. When I first started to write for Test Pattern, when we were actually creating the online entertainment industry, what you see today, the term online journalist didn't exist. The powers that be, the established mainstream entertainment companies, also the film studios and TV networks, viewed us as renegades rather than journalists. In fact, in those early years, we had to fight the status quo to be taken seriously as journalists, and we had to fight to be called online journalists. I remember one Hollywood studio, their head of publicity, calling me a renegade on the phone and hanging up on me when I was fighting to have test pattern recognized by the studio, on the same level as the other top news resources. He simply didn't take the internet seriously. The fact of the time was, our main outlet had more daily readers each day than many of the top mainstream movie or TV magazines and newspapers. Despite how that studio head felt about us renegades, he couldn't ignore us and deny us access to the studio, and we knew it. Another major factor in being taken seriously as journalists at the time was the coming attractions policy or approach on writing and reporting stories. To this day, I'm so grateful for the editor and owner of Coming Attractions and his commitment to being the most ethical and credible movie news resource. As an editor, his high standards set the bar for other outlets to aspire to at the time. As writers online in those early days, at the very outset of the online entertainment industry, we knew that we had to be even more credible, more ethical, and even more trustworthy than traditional journalists in order not to be seen as renegades. As team members, we'd often have meetings about this and how to earn respect in the industry. Back then, it was all new, and the title actually meant something and gave us something professional to aspire to in the industry. We wanted to be taken seriously. We could report and write news faster, but with the same level of quality as traditional media. We knew this. We eventually earned that title of online journalist to be seen as credible. Back then, it actually meant something because we are the first to bring that term into existence. And as someone on the front lines of that fight in the early days of the internet, it's something I'm truly proud of to this day. Interestingly, though, there is a bittersweet aspect to finally earning that title of online journalist on a much deeper level of life, especially on a level of starting over and the cyclical nature of life. I remember one moment in the early days of online journalism, at the peak momentum of the online movie movement, I was invited to tour the Pixar Animation Campus in San Francisco with a select number of top journalists. We were also touring the Industrial Light and Magic Studio the next day to get a look at the inner workings of a variety of Pixar and ILM-related projects. The first day at Pixar, we broke for lunch, and I sat down at a table beside an older gentleman, 
dressed in a more formal blazer and dress pants. Nice, but it was a dated look, like he had just stepped out of the 70s or 80s. We exchanged pleasantries, but he was cold and standoffish with me. He looked lonely and somewhat out of place in such a modern setting. He was an older journalist from a traditional entertainment magazine somewhere in the U.S. We were on the media tour together. We were colleagues. Over lunch, as I sat there eating, glancing at him in silence, I realized exactly why he was cold and standoffish to me. I was the young journalist from the unknown online world, a renegade, a new breed of journalist that was taking over the industry. I represented the new wave of journalists that were forcing the older generation of journalists out of work. As I sat there, I got why he had an aversion to speaking with me. He knew his time was almost up. His career window was closing. I'll never forget this moment as long as I live. I knew I was forcing him out of the industry, and he'd soon be starting over. I felt bad for him. I actually had a lot of respect for him in paving the ground for me to actually sit next to him. What's so fascinating to me now, after a 20-plus year career as an online entertainment journalist, a pioneer in the industry itself, the exact same thing happened to me years later. I was suddenly the older guy in the game, and by 2015, social platforms dominated the online landscape, and I was forced to start over. What's new eventually becomes old, and the cycle repeats itself. When I look back on my time with Coming Attractions and Test Pattern, there were so many firsts in a span of five years between 1996 and 2001. We created the very first standalone television entertainment website on the internet when we launched Test Pattern as its own site in 2001. We were the first movie news website to create and offer readers a paid exclusive newsletter with exclusive monthly bonus content. We were the first entertainment outlet to create many of the editorial content formats you see today on most entertainment websites. We were one of the very first remote working content teams on the entire internet. And some of our writers at Test Pattern went on to do even greater things in entertainment. I was able to give opportunity to others in the same way it was given to me. I'm forever grateful to all those people. Looking back now, having also been one of the top interviewers in the entertainment industry, having interviewed over a thousand celebrities, actors, filmmakers, and people from all walks of life, my very first interview was with Test Pattern. It was the late actor David Ogden Steers who played Major Winchester on the hit TV series MASH. Again, like my earlier call with the ABC executive, for that interview, I was so nervous. But it went off without a hitch. He was a pro, and it kicked off my career as an interviewer. None of that would have happened had I not made that call to ABC, and instead gave in to fear. When it comes to starting over, though, Nothing could have prepared me personally or professionally for the major turning point of Test Pattern. In the year 2000, like I mentioned about Test Pattern, we decided to turn the television section of Coming Attractions into its own website. We purchased the URL www.testpattern.net, and we spent 2000 and the majority of 2001 designing the website ourselves after working with professional designers who couldn't get it right. We also created the new logo. Redesigning the website was truly a do-it-yourself effort between my writing partner and I for many months. We added new sections, new content, television show profiles, home entertainment release dates, feature stories, interviews, and database-type options, all at a time when it was brand new in the industry. It sounds so interesting to name those off because they're so commonplace today, but when we were doing them back then, it was brand new. We spent months getting the site just right to finally land on an eventual launch date. It was a big deal. Our readers had been waiting months for the new launch of the website. I remember the launch day like it was yesterday. We stayed up all night working on the new layout so it would be ready for readers in the morning to wake up to so they could read and experience throughout the day. I got off the computer at 5.45 a.m. just when the sun was coming up happy that the new version of Test Pattern was launched for the day. I could finally rest and sleep for the rest of the day. I sat down on the couch, grabbed the remote, turned on the TV, and started to flip through the channels. As I changed the channels, something caught my eye. I went backward on the TV, only to see a burning building with billowing black smoke. It was breaking news of the first World Trade Center hit by a plane in Manhattan, American Airlines Flight 11. 
which had just crashed into the first tower. Minutes later, I continued to watch in horror as the second plane, United Airlines Flight 175, crashed into the south tower of the World Trade Center. We relaunched Test Pattern on September 11, 2001, the same morning the entire world started over and was thrust into the unknown. Less than a year later in 2002, due to circumstances beyond our control, my writing partner and I had to start our careers over again at the peak of our popularity and momentum, when the owner of Coming Attractions, our boss and editor, sold the entertainment outlet to a larger, well-known movie magazine and brand. Suddenly, everything we had achieved in the entertainment industry was gone. One second, we were on top of the world, at the very top of the entertainment industry, with the keys to the entire kingdom. The next second, almost overnight, we were back to where we started, as if none of it ever happened. What would we do next? How could we capitalize on the momentum we already built for ourselves? How could we leverage our reputations to further our careers in the industry and pick up where we left off? After being on the front lines of the internet, creating the online entertainment industry, innovating, paving new ground, our future was up in the air. Our momentum halted, stopped just as the industry was gaining more traction. Also, just as we had earned the respect of the major film studios and television networks, the mainstream powers, the corporate establishment, and earned the title of online journalists after starting out as renegades, we still had much more work to accomplish and more work of the industry to innovate. We had become two of the top entertainment journalists in the new modern age of online journalism, which we were helping to create in real time. Suddenly, as quickly as our early success was at the beginning, seemingly overnight we had lost our home outlet and the newly launched website we created. In late 2002, my writing and business partner and I started over in the entertainment industry. Our future was up in the air and in the unknown. We had to figure out the next steps to take. We had to capitalize on momentum and continue our upward trajectory in the industry. I remember that period of uncertainty like it was yesterday. It was also the most bizarre feeling to have such a fast-rising career, a reputation, and top media access in Hollywood, only to have it all taken away in an instant. One minute you have everything, the next minute you have nothing, and you're forced to start over. Luckily, however, that had already happened to me in my personal life, when I was hit by a car, left in a coma, endured five years of recovery, underwent brain surgery, lost everything that was familiar to me, and I was forced to start over again on the most extreme level. And I say the word luckily because it's proof of how an extremely bad situation in life can become a major advantage. My accident and recovery in my personal life prepared me for similar challenges and obstacles in my professional life. In many ways, on a level of being, at the core of my being, I already knew what to do. There was nothing to fear. Hope existed in the unknown. It was really a matter of being fearless and making the unknown known. Our next step in the entertainment industry took us to New York City, the Big Apple, Broadway, with the remote team of writers from Test Pattern, where my writing partner and I struck the biggest deal of our lives. This deal opened up the entertainment industry to us even more, taking us directly to Hollywood as media, managing editors, top journalists, up-and-coming writers, remote workers, and new modern online entrepreneurs. After landing the biggest opportunity of my life with Test Pattern and Coming Attractions, only five years later, being forced to start over created even more opportunity and propelled my career to new heights, taking me around North America to movie and television productions, star-studded media events, world premiere red carpets, all while creating, managing, and maintaining several groundbreaking websites that pushed the industry in a new direction, including the early online screenwriting industry, which we were part of. Stay tuned for the next episode of Starting Over Drive Turning Points called Starting Over, Losing Opportunity, and Making the Unknown Known, in which I tell the story of how my writing partner and I started over after being at the very top of the entertainment industry, and how we regained our momentum, cast fear aside, to take our careers to even bigger heights online during the early days of the online entertainment industry. When all seems lost and you're forced to start over, sometimes it's the best thing that can happen. Thanks for listening to the Starting Over Drive podcast. Join us next time for another real story of starting over. In the meantime, make sure to follow us on Spotify, 
YouTube, Amazon, Stitcher, and all major podcasting platforms. Head to the Starting Overdrive Facebook page, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to our channels, help us grow, and feel free to share your story of starting over. Or even let us know if you relate to any of the issues touched upon in our interviews. You can also find us at the Starting Overdrive podcast at the official site, www.startingoverdrive.com. Thank you.